what do you believe? Because God's going to ask you about that. I believe that this world was created by an awesome God that desired for things to go very differently than they did. That's how I see it. And I believe that it was necessary that the Son of God find himself on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins, not his own, but yours and mine. I believe that because Jesus paid the price on the cross, that I can know fellowship with a very loving God. I can have peace with God because of what Jesus did. What do you believe? I believe that God desires that no one should perish, not one person, and that he makes his love available to everyone. And I believe that someday, each one of us, when we choose to take on this thing called faith and live a life depending on what Jesus and he alone did on that cross, we will abide in the eternal realm with God forever. I can't tell you I know what that looks like, but I can tell you I know it's true. What do you believe? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much this morning for the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior. He truly is the King of glory, the great I am, love incarnate, and the Savior of our souls. Oh, Father, there are not enough words to tell you thank you. And so we come and we join our hearts together and we just worship you, God. We just give you our lives and we worship you and praise you and long to have fellowship with you. You know, apart from you teaching us how to live, Lord, we would never know how to leave the dark places, the dead places. We would never know what it looks like to actually taste that eternal life that you've promised. But we know that not only is that our eternal destination, but it's our present reality because we have fellowship with you. So bring revelation this morning, Lord, because we're looking for a fresh word from heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so last night was Halloween. Did you celebrate Halloween? No. It tends to be kind of dark, doesn't it? Does it take kind of a dark time? Honestly, my husband will tell you that I can make anything spiritual, so here it goes. <laughs> For me, Halloween is a reminder that this world is dark apart from the light of Jesus Christ. And I get a chance to choose to live in the light. You have a choice to live in the light of Christ's love. Did you know that? Now, I don't hate Halloween, but Halloween just tends to be played up as kind of, I don't know, gory and nasty, doesn't it? But can I tell you that just knowing that people go around with masks and whatever on that night, it's just a reminder that people do that every day of the week anyway. Yep, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Don't make it nasty. You're not in this world. You're just, you're just kind of like passing through, right? 
You're an observer of what's going on. And when you have eternity in mind and you have it in your heart, you can tell the difference. You don't take exception all of a sudden. You just go like, yeah, no. Boy, do I love the light of Jesus Christ. Boy, do I love living in the light places. Boy, do I like it when Jesus takes the veil away and lets me see. Amen? Masks, they just simply cover us, don't they? It's the dark places. Yeah, I was thinking about that, you know, Halloween thing. I don't imagine the p folks in Halloween, though, went around with black scarves that had crosses on them, do you? <laughs> but, you know, let's just face it, I could, I could, I could be scary. <laughs> Am I scary for you? <laughs> no. All righty, so much for that. <coughs> Jesus. You have to love how he presents things sometimes. He is this amazing Savior who was always trying to get our attention. How does he do it? He does it with questions. How many times has Jesus asked you questions about your heart? He asks me all the time, every day. Is that really what you want to say? Is that really what you want to do? Do you really want to go there? <laughs> caution, caution, don't go there. Don't go there. Yeah, Jesus. You know, he wants to lift that veil off from each one of us, that mask. We are all about masquerading. We like to let people think that we are just these flawless folk, and you and I know that's not true, don't we? We know it. And it's, an, and it's a journey of endless growth. Let's talk about our passage this morning for just a minute, okay? Because Jesus comes into town, and he's met by people who actually say that they believe who he is, but they're really not looking for who he says he really is. Now, what do I mean by that? You and I can say what we believe, and we can talk up the good game, I could sound very spiritual. Would you like me to stand here and sound really spiritual for you, or would you like me to get real with you? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, nice. There's a few of you. Oh, you over here, I'll talk spiritual to you. <laughs> you over here, I'm going to get real with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I know, I know. It is the love of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, that he allows us to see the light about ourselves. And we can just sit in that dark place forever, can't we? Yep, yep, none of us really love it when Jesus brings change. Well, he brings change to these friends that he loves dearly. He does. He brings a word to them. He basically says to Martha first, Martha, death is the enemy, but I've overcome it. And she's like, well, if you'd have just been here, Lord, if you'd have just been here, this wouldn't have happened. He's like, you didn't hear me. I am the resurrection, and I am the life. Yep. I know that we're going to rise together in another time, in, in the day of the Lord. We're going to rise together. You still didn't get it, Martha. How many times does Jesus come to you and talk to you about the same stuff? Does he? Because she has to get herself aligned with Jesus. You and I are going to have to get ourselves aligned with the reality of heaven. Jesus is not going to align himself with this world. Is he? Is he going to start doing things the way the world does? Do you really think that's going to happen? I don't think so. It's always about taking off the mask and taking off the pretending and taking off the lack of really wanting to hear the truth. People do not... How many of you realize people do not want to hear the truth most times? They don't want to hear the truth. Do you want to hear the truth? Yeah, until it hurts. <laughs> when I tell you that your attitude stinks, you go like, who's she talking to? <laughs> when I tell you that it's been more than four days that your attitude has stunk, who is she talking to? She couldn't be talking about me. You know, any time that we do not exalt 
the king of glory. We do have stinking thinking. We do. Because it needs to be about Jesus and the reality of heaven. So we've got this thing going on in our lesson. Lazarus, he's died. Martha tells Jesus it would have gone different. The next thing we see is Mary comes onto the scene, and Mary says, Jesus. But first she falls at his feet. So that's a posture of worship, right? Jesus, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. So there's number two. There is the second one of his closest friends that still don't see that he is life. Life incarnate, get it? Life incarnate is standing in front of Mary in that moment. She's bowed down, but she still cannot see. It's one of these, isn't it? She still can't see. She's blinded by the dark thinking of this world. You and I have to get beyond that. And it's a day by pardon me, day by day journey. We have to get beyond that. Because he really is asking, what do you believe? If you believe, I will reveal these things to you. I will show you how miraculous my love is. I will show you that you don't have to stay in the dead places of your life anymore. Lazarus does raise from the dead, but I'll tell you what, it cost Jesus a whole lot to do that. Because in that moment when Lazarus came out of the tomb, and he did, Jesus raised him. Some people believed, and some hardened their heart, and they did not believe. It was right there in front of them, but they struggled to receive it. See, eternal things will be hard for you to receive. You'll have to press through for it. You've got to know what you're entitled to. Do you know what you're entitled to? Joy unspeakable and full of glory, amen? And joy in the hard places. Keep in mind that Mary and Martha and Lazarus probably never thought they'd find themselves in this place. After all, they're really good friends of Jesus. He loved them. How could something like this happen to friends of Jesus? You know, facing death. Death is inevitable in this world. We caused that, not God. It wasn't his plan. Death is the enemy, isn't it? Do you believe death is an enemy? <clears throat> but notice that Jesus overcomes all of that. The other day I took my mother to um, an imaging center in Clearwater. And I was sitting waiting for her to have one of her tests. And <coughs> Pardon me. There was a woman there, probably, I don't know, I'd like to think that she was older than me, but she was probably the same age. <laughs> Some of you got that. And... Um, she was striking up conversations of hope with the women in the center. They were all women. And uh, she, she was sitting there. She had a blanket over her shoulder like this, you know. And she said, you know, life is short. And we must really appreciate our blessings. And I said, I was sitting there reading the scripture, preparing for this morning and praying. And I said, yes. And she said, you know, um, 20 years ago, and she's there for treatment, by the way, 20 years ago, she said, I found myself with this. And she pulls back this blanket and she has her hand and her forearm have been amputated. And she said, you know, and I was trying to deal with the emotional baggage of losing my hand and my forearm. And my 22-year-old baby, 22-month-old baby baby 
who was born with multiple anomalies, she said, died. And she said, and I thought to myself, God, I wonder how you're going to fill me and keep me going. She's sitting there talking to me. I'm like, oh my gosh, right? Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. Amen. So I, s- I just kind of looked at her and I said, only God can, right? And she proceeded to tell me about these amazing blessings in her life that God had brought forth. Oh, he did this for her, and he's taken her here, and she's managed to travel, and she can tell her story. And oh my gosh, she now has this little baby girl grandchild. And she said, you know, God has just so filled me, and I'm so full of joy. And I thought to myself, how, how, apart from eternity in her mind and heart, could she find herself there? You say, well, you know, Pastor Mary, that's 20 years ago. Oh, God. I can't imagine what she went through and the first things out of my mouth are praises. Can you? It's the work of Christ. See, he has a way to get us past the dead things. He does. Nobody else can take you there but Jesus. See, he has this way of helping us see when we're going through things that it's just a temporary and it's on to another realm of understanding. This woman knew that she was going to go on in life with or without her hand and forearm. And she was going to enjoy it. Why? Because Jesus loves her. And she knew she was going to get beyond the loss of her infant, not because it would be easy, but because Jesus said that he, he was the one that was going to bear our griefs. And he was going to heal her heart, and he did. He healed her heart. I was so impressed. I was just like, Jesus, oh my gosh. I love hearing these stories of you doing these things in people's lives because it's truth, and people rarely tell those stories. How many things could you share that God has done in your life that would make a difference in somebody else today if you just shared those things, right? Here's this woman. She doesn't know anybody in the room, but I'll tell you what, there were probably six other women in there when mom was back having her scan and every one of them just sat there stunned with the joy and the testimony of how big her God is. How big is your God? Big enough to change some things in you? Big enough to heal some places of hurt in you? Is he big enough to do that? Because Mary and Martha aren't looking for God to do that. They just want to weep. They just want to rationalize. And what Jesus really comes to do is to fill us with himself and to make us understand that life is a lot bigger than what we can see and what we can taste and experience with our senses. There's a lot behind the veil. A lot. A lot of truth. Scripture says that Jesus tore the veil, doesn't it? He tore the veil. Why? Because he wants us to see. He wants us to see. He wants us to taste and experience eternity. Because if we just have a little minute of that eternal power flashing in us, that reality, we'll face anything. I got a feeling that each one of us, either have or will or someday may face some really difficult places 
Maybe some of you could testify already. Maybe some of us will testify today. And maybe some of us will have a testimony for tomorrow. But it will always be necessary to take a person beyond what has happened to what God did. See, Jesus took Mary, Martha, and Lazarus at his own cost because they crucified him right afterwards. Amen? At his own cost. And he took them from one place of understanding and showed them a realm they would never forget. Lazarus, you know he told the story after he came out of that tomb. Are you kidding? And don't you think Mary and Martha got a whole lot bigger in what they believed in a moment? I want to be filled with that kind of belief. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. Now, I don't know what you're holding on to that's good and those promises, but God says don't let them go. I don't know what things you're holding on to that need to go. Amen? Some dead stuff in your life. But no, he is the life and the resurrection, and he wants to free each one of us. He wants those chains gone, gone. And what do we have left? Just that reality to know that every day that your feet hit the ground and that you have eyes to see, it can be a day where God reveals something glorious about himself to you. Don't miss it. What will you see today? I'll tell you what, I bet you've already seen some stuff here today. I bet that you have felt the presence of God today in a sweet and special way. And if you haven't, it's because your mind is distracted or your heart is not ready for it. I hope you all have. We're going to come to the table of the Lord. And when you come to the table of the Lord, the Bible says that you have to have peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we get real with you here in this place, Lord. We appreciate the story and the lessons from your word because they teach us truth. And help us to see, God, that we truly are people who prefer the dark places. We say we want light, but only in the places that we think we can control. But this morning, God, we confess to you that we have walked in darkness, selfishness, self-centeredness, things that are against your love. We've sinned against your love, God. We confess that. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to realize those areas. And in this moment of quiet time, before we come to your table, we want you to search our hearts and help us to see those places you want to redeem and to resurrect. Help us to have the right mindsets, Lord, to receive from you. Soften our hearts and call us by name to your table. We ask for your forgiveness, and we ask for your peace, and we praise you, God, that you are all-knowing and all-wisdom and all truth. So we bow in Jesus' name. Amen.